Hi, greetings everybody and welcome to another edition of Jamie's Journeys. Today we're coming to you from Monavesia, Greece. This is located on the mainland or the Peloponnese. Now the main reason we come here is so that our guests can go visit the ancient ruins of Mistras. But for those who would like another experience, staying more close to home, do some touring and exploring, you can visit ancient Monavesia. Just down across this causeway, down about one kilometer. It's a fantastic place to visit. It's a place with wonderful history. And right now, I'm gonna take you there. We're gonna hop on the bus for two euro. So let's go. All right, the uh, word monovasia is the Greek is translated in Greek to single entrance. And the first inhabitants of the rock uh, were in about the year 583. And they were people from the mainland and also from Sparta who came to flee from the Avars and the Slavs. Anyway, let's uh, go take a look inside. Well, this is a great little out of the way spot, and I thought I'd sit here and uh, tell you some of the story of this great little city and what a story it has. Let's now go back to the year 747, and this is a year when a plague actually devastated Monavasia. In fact, it devastated the surrounding areas of Monavasia. But coming out of the after effects of that, for some reason, Monavasia grew and to become even greater importance. The Ottoman occupation in Monavasia ended after a four month siege in 1821. And Monavasia became the first city to be liberated by the Greeks during their War of Independence in 1821. Well, here we are in the center square. In uh, 1821, after the liberation of the city, uh, many of the families that fled in the year 1770 returned to Monavasia. But uh, they came back to really what was a ruined and insignificant city, and a city with a very poor infrastructure. But they still try to make a life of it here once again. All right, now when you're standing in that main square and you have the church behind you, if you look left, there's a set of stairs that are gonna take you down to someplace very special. I'm gonna show you. Let's go. Wait till you see this, come on. All right, Mona Vesia, one entrance. Actually, no, this is called the Portello, and this is the second entrance. But here is your reward. Beautiful, just beautiful. Wow, if these walls could talk, what a story they would tell. And this water, how absolutely beautiful. You wanna swim in the Aegean? This could be an opportunity. Nice little area down here, there's a ladder. You can go in easy, come out easy. 
bring your towel. Have a little refreshing swim before you get back to the city. Well, we don't have time for the refreshing swim, but it is time for us to get back up to the city. come up about 50 meters uh, from the waterfront and uh, we just found the most charming spot and the most charming gentleman who is a local so to speak and this is Byron Byron hello I'm nice Byron. to meet you <laughs> pleased to meet you yeah, and, uh, the, the, the name of this establishment is Byron's Kamar so I guess that's named after you yes it is indeed uh, when I retired from uh, active work 10 years ago I decided to drop the anchor here we've had this house for 40 years, always had our holidays here. Yeah. And uh, we opened up this uh, wine tasting about 10 months ago because the area has a lot of history in various aspects of activities, but particularly in winemaking. Mm. Wine was famous from Monemvasia back in the Middle Ages when uh, the Venetians first occupied uh, Monemvasia. They loved the wine, and we have proof, documented proof, uh, at the Byzantine Museum in Venice of commercial exchanges between Monemvasia and, uh, and the, the Venetians for wine. They called the, mal the wine Malvo uh, Malvasia, which was an alliteration of the name Monemvasia. And uh, after about a century, they actually took also the vines from here and planted them throughout Italy. Mm. Today, the Smalvasia wines throughout Italy, they make a dry wine, dry white wine with it. The original wine, however, was a sweet wine. Where they let the grapes dry in the sun to increase the alcohol content, mm -hmm. the sugar content. And uh, so it was a sweet wine, probably amber color, I say, probably because we don't know that for, for sure, and uh, made with local varieties. Well, these local varieties have been now identified, and what you're drinking now, to your health, That's is, so of you. Thank you. Is, is actually one of these varieties. Mm. Mm. Wow, that is fantastic. Called uh, Kidonica, and uh, mm. it was one of the um, components of this uh, famous wine. So, in 1997, a local gentleman from a village not far from here, which is full of uh, vineyards, uh, he had studied nuclear physics, but he decided to revive uh, the wine legend uh, here. And uh, he identified local varieties with the help of the University of Athens and Thessaloniki and the Institute of uh, uh, Research in Athens, Research Institute in Athens, and they identified 32 local varieties. Mm -hmm. They boiled that down to about 10, and then they started doing DNA analysis with the varieties that had been exported to Italy, as I told you earlier. Yeah. And that then helped them to boil it down to three. Mm -hmm. And these three were probably the constituents of the original wine. Yeah. We now have permission to produce this wine. It's a DOC, in, in other words, Appellation Contrôlée. And from February uh, 2013, we will circulate with the sweet wine. Meanwhile, we use these grapes to make the wines that you're drinking. Yeah, well, it's fantastic. And what drew us here was the peacefulness of this little corner of the city you have and your classical music and to see the inside of the building it is also so beautiful. So we're honored to be here. We thank you very much for your hospitality. You must help. And, uh, you know, it's such a quaint city. There's lots of restaurants and other places you can go to. But Byron's Kamar is very, very nice. Huh. Well, I... Uh, 
climbed a ways up into the hill. Really had to hustle. But there are um, remains of dwellings all over the place. It's all covered in the brush. Uh, you can see it, uh, but you can be in, begin to imagine that truly, maybe at one time, 25,000 people did live up here. What an amazing place to live. Amazing place to come to also if you have good footwear and you have the stamina to get up and also the stamina to get down. Great spot. Yes, this view is truly amazing. You know, in 1911, the last residents moved off the plateau of the rocks, which had become nothing more than an expanse of ruins, like what still, in many ways, exists today. Statistics from 1971 recorded Monavesia's low mark in population and had only 32 inhabitants in this entire town. Well, once again, uh, just like Myron, uh, foreigners have taken over the city and are now rebuilding Monavesia. Uh, visitors from abroad or Greeks from distant Athens have now come to settle. And today the beauty, the romanticism, and the faded glory of this once important city allures these foreigners. Now there are quaint hotels uh, located throughout here and residents often even rent out their villas uh, on a weekly basis. Yet there's still plots of land available if you too would like to buy. For an exorbitant price, you get a little plot of land, all the rocks and all the rubble <laughs> that come with it. And then you hire these specialty builders who will come and piece your new villa together, giving you just a beautiful, beautiful look. This ancient, remote yet strategic fortified city still has a strong power of attraction. But this time it's for quaint and quiet getaways, for maybe strolling the ancient streets, for shopping, or for taking in a meal with a view. But the power of attraction is certainly nothing new for this sacred rock, which is known as the Gibraltar of Greece. So thanks for joining me on another Jamie's Journey, and I hope you come travel with me again.